Hey guys, how are you? So I'm just sitting here crunching on a, a Twizzler. I'm oh, sorry, that's kind of mean. You guys can't get Twizzlers there, huh? In Germany. Darn it. Okay. Make note to self. Send more Twizzlers. Do family. Anyway. <sighs> it's been a long day here. It's only 4 o'clock, but I feel like it's been a really long day. We had a meeting today, and it just like seems like a really weird day. And then I did go to the post office, and I mailed some Valentine present to Angelo and Rosemary, since they won't be here for Valentine's Day. I'll get to give June her present in person, but Angelo and Rosie, be on the lookout at the mail. It's going to go to Marcel's house, and then I'm sure he'll bring it right to you. So I, I imagine it'll take about a week. So anyway, it's been a busy day, and I just feel like so disheveled. But anyway, let, let's read. That always makes me feel calmer and better. Today, I'm going to read this book called Blue. And it will appeal to the artists in the family because it's the history of the color blue. I don't know about you guys, but I never really think about where colors come from, like how they were created, how they were mixed how you know like back in the day and originally how um <clears throat> prehistoric people made chalk or paint or whatever they used uh as um forms of art but this book is going to tell us about the color blue so i thought that would be really interesting for us it's by nana akua brew hammond that's her name and the illustrator is Caldecott Honor winner David Minter. I think he is the illustrator. He might be partially the writer. I don't know. It doesn't really specify. But anyway, let's read this book. I want to learn about blue. Here goes. Blue. A history of the color as deep as the sea and as wide as the sky. The color blue is all around us. Have you ever wondered where it comes from? It's in the sky, but you can't touch it. It's in the sea, but when you cup it, it disappears. You can crush iris petals for a brilliant shade, but just add water and away it fades. But then blue appears in the strangest places, discovered throughout history in unexpected ways. As early as 4500 BC, diggers found blue rocks called lapis lazuli in mines deep below Afghanistan's sar e sang Valley. Ancient Egyptians used the rocks mostly to make jewelry. Some wore them as charms, believing they had the power to protect people from evil. But with time, they found new ways to use this underground find. By 44 BC, many Egyptians, including Queen Cleopatra, the, I don't know what number that is, were applying a bluish mixture around their eyes that looked like eyeshadow made with ground lapis, I hope I'm saying that right, you guys, lapis lazuli grains, plants, and animal fat. More than 600 years later, artists began painting sculptures, walls, and canvases with blue from the crushed rocks too. It was a royal pain for those who made the paint and so expensive, only the wealthy could buy it. Since it was a luxury and in such high demand, for centuries, scientists, merchants, and dry dyers looked for more sources of blue. Then, on the shores of the Mediterranean, Central America, Mexico, and Japan, dyers found blue in the belly of certain shellfish. A Phoenician myth says a dog discovered the color. Finding a snail on the beach, the pup ate it up. The snail turned the dog's tongue purple-blue, and from that moment, a new industry was born. Dyers had different ways of releasing the color. In Mexico, they pressed the snail's foot 
In the Middle East, they cracked its shell. Depending on the snail, the color starts out a milky white or brownish yellow, but once it's in the air and the sun, it quickly turns green, then reddish purple, and with more sunlight, blue. But whether dyers pressed or cracked, snail blue was hard to produce. Each snail released just one or two drops. Imagine how many snails and drops it took to dye a royal robe, not to mention enough fabric to fill a merchant's ship. Chop. Plus the poor snails, how about them? Perhaps because blue was the color of the heavens, yet so rare and hard to create on earth, people around the world considered the color holy. In an old Liberian folktale, blue is explained as a gift that connects God to humans. In Italy, from the 13th century onward, some artists began reserving blue to paint the robes of Mary, the mother of Jesus. In Indonesia, some say special prayers to ward off evil spirits before they make the dye. In Israel, blue drapes hung in the temple King Solomon built, and many Jews still wear blue dyed threads called tekhalet. For years, snail blue was the most popular color, but all along there was another way to find blue in nature. In parts of Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, and the Americas, a group of plants in the pea family grew. They were called Indigofera. There were a few different ways to get blue from these plants green leaves. Indian dyers soaked them in water while West African dyers crushed and dried them. When they added ashes or urine, it enabled the dye to dissolve in water so it could bind to fabric. Wow. Since it was cheaper for dyers to produce blue from the indigo plant than from rocks and snails, and the shade was just as vibrant and long-lasting, indigo dye, especially indigo from India and West Africa, was eventually valued by most lovers of the color as the best of the blues. India and Nigeria became powerful centers for making and trading indigo. People made clothing, makeup, and medicine with it. Indigo became so precious, people spent it like money. In parts of Africa, some merchants used strips of indigo cloth to buy people and sell them into slavery. Well, that's pretty awful. In India and Bangladesh, some planters tricked or forced poor farmers to grow indigo plants instead of food. In the United States, some made the African captives they had enslaved farm indigo, calling the plant a cash crop because it brought in a lot of money. In this evil side of the trade for blue, leaders and landowners around the world abused or enslaved countless people just so they could grow more indigo. Well, this is a very sad part of the history of the color blue, isn't it? From the time blue was found, scientists worked hard to make a blue that wasn't so difficult or cruel to produce. See, enter science. In 1865, scientist Adolf von Bayer began trying, and 40 years later, in 1905, he won the Nobel Prize for creating a chemical blue. Yay! Finally, everyone, not just the wealthy, could afford something blue. But it was always about more than just having a blue outfit, piece of jewelry, or work of art. Because of its scarcity, mystery, and holy associations, blue was more than a color. It was a feeling. We feel blue when we're sad, perhaps because the people who had to dig, grind, and grow passed down their painful memories of working the mines or of slavery on indigo plantations. Africans enslaved in America sang prayers that sounded like tears. The songs were called spirituals, and they inspired a style of music called the blues, originally known for its aching words and melodies. We feel excited when something happens out of the blue, perhaps because the color was once so rare, a discovery that seemed to appear out of thin air. And blue was still considered extraordinary, as it was once the color of royalty. 
This could be why around the world, blue ribbons are pinned for first prize. Today, dyers still use indigo to make blankets and clothing, and some doctors still use it as a natural medicine. Maybe because blue has such a complicated history of pain, wealth, invention, and recovery, it's become a symbol of possibility as vast and deep as the bluest sea and as wide open and high as the bluest sky. And this is a whole bunch more about blue, which I'm not going to read all that because it's a lot. But that was really interesting. I really learned a lot. Hey, so I was curious about this um, Adolf von Bayer. I think that's how you say his name, but you German people will have to correct me. Um, I was a little curious about him. So I couldn't find anything really kid related to, um, you know, like a YouTuber or anything about him. But here on the Nobel Prize website is a little bit about him. Um, he was born in 1835 in Berlin. He died the 20th of August, 1917. He was German, like I said. Uh, affiliation at the time of the award, Munich University in Munich, Germany. And his prize was in recognition of his services in the advancement of organic chemistry and the chemical industry through his work on organic dyes and hydroaromatic compounds. Phew. So he had, uh, he was a chemist and um, from Germany. The most important of these were, was the blue dye indigo, which thanks to von Bayer could now be produced industrially instead of being extracted from plants. This made it much less expensive to produce. Another group of dyes von Bayer studied were Fiddlings. I don't know, guys. You know I can't say these things. <laughs> so, there you go. And there's, there he is. And all those little snails certainly thank him because they don't have to give up their lives anymore to have the color blue on the planet. So, that was interesting. At least I hope you guys found it interesting and not too boring. Um, a little science thrown in with our reading fun today. So I love you guys. I hope you are having a nice day and tucked in all cozy and warm for those of you who are getting ready to go to bed right now or perhaps even in bed. It's probably like 10 o'clock there, I think, in Germany. Um, but only dinner time here. So June at her house and Bima and Captain at, her house, at our house are uh, going to go get ready for dinner soon. I love you all. Have a good night.